Good day, and welcome to the Molson Coors Beverage Company fourth quarter and fiscal year 2020 earnings conference call. You can find related slides on the investor relations page of the Molson Coors website. Our speakers for today's call are Gavin Hattersley, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Tracy Duvair, Chief Financial Officer. Please note that this event is being recorded. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Greg Tierney, Vice President of FTNA and Investor Relations. Mr. Tierney, please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and hello, everyone. Following prepared remarks from Gavin and Tracy, we'll take your questions. Please limit yourself to one question, and if you have more than one question, please ask your most pressing question first, and then re-enter the queue to follow up. If you have technical questions on the quarter, please pick them up with our IR team uh, in the days and the weeks that follow. Today's discussions include forward-looking statements, and actual results or trends could differ materially from our forecasts. For more information, please refer to the risk factors discussed in our most recent filings with the SEC. We assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements. And gap reconciliations for any non-U.S. gap measures are included in our news release or otherwise available on our website. Also, unless otherwise indicated, all financial results the company discusses are versus the comparable prior year period and in U.S. dollars. And with that, over to you, Gavin. Thank you, Greg, and thank you all for joining us today. 2020 was an incredibly challenging year for everyone, Molson Coors included. But in many respects, I consider us lucky. The revitalization plan we put in place in October of 2019 positioned our company well to weather the storms of 2020. Our business was leaner and more nimble, which put us in a better position to conserve resources as the circumstances dictated and to deploy them effectively as the circumstances allowed. And the results bear that out. When you consider what we set out to do under our revitalization plan, we accomplished an incredible amount in 2020, and that has given us a tremendous springboard for 2021. Our two largest brands, Coors Light and Miller Light, are our iconic core, grew 6.1 and 8.6% in the U.S. off-premise, respectively. Our above premium brands in the U.S. reached a record high percentage of the portfolio in the second half of 2020. Beyond beer, our first foray into non-alcohol cannabis beverages through the Trust Joint Venture has netted the number one dollar share spot in the entire Canadian cannabis beverage market. We increased our production capacity for our fast-growing seltzers by approximately 400%. And we approximately doubled our annual investments in our hometown communities. That is the story of Molson Coors in 2020. Now, you may be wondering why I have such confidence, especially if you only look at our consolidated top-line results in the fourth quarter. But that number alone does not tell the full story. And if you only look at that piece of data, you'll miss it. Our top-line results in the fourth quarter were overwhelmingly due to losses resulting from government restrictions in the European on-premise channel. To put it more bluntly, Europe alone accounts for 92% of our fourth quarter top-line decline. But those results are not reflective of the performance we've seen across the rest of the business, and the story is very different in our largest market. Well, how different? In the fourth quarter, Molson Coors grew net sales revenue in the United States. We grew the top line in the United States. Our plan is working. <clears throat> so let's look deeper at our results in 2020 and what we have in store for 2021. Our first pillar under the revitalization plan was to build on the strength of our iconic core. In the U.S., our largest beers, Coors Light and Miller Light, delivered 6.1% and 8.6% respective growth in the off-premise. They again grew share in the premium light beer segment, and they finished 2020 with stronger brand health. We're pleased but not satisfied with those results. So in 2021, we're going to put even more marketing behind these two iconic brands. And we're thinking big, as you may have noticed around the big game last weekend. And again, I want to point something out here. We are demonstrating our ability to grow in Celsius and expand beyond beer while strengthening our core brands. We are demonstrating we can do both. 
The revitalization plan was specifically designed to free up resources so we can meaningfully invest behind our core, our growth and above premium, and our expansion beyond beer. In the second half of 2020, above premium products hit a record high portion of our U.S. portfolio relative to any prior year comparable period. We doubled our share of Celsius in the U.S., moving towards our double-digit share goal by the end of this year. Busy has been a top 10 growth brand for nearly six straight months. Busy's incredible growth has been accomplished with basically just one pack. In a few weeks, we plan to add more firepower to that brand with a second variety pack, and a few weeks later, we plan to launch Busy Lemonade, a lineup we believe is tailor-made for Busy given its unique antioxidant vitamin C attributes. And we are excited about the opportunity for Coors Delta, which launched at the end of September. We are seeing promising signs, including repeat rates that are stronger than Bud Light Delta and Corona Delta at the same point during their launch. In 2021, we have strong plans to accelerate marketing support behind Coors Delta, as well as its commitment to help save America's rivers. And that's just the beginning. We are about to launch Topo Chica Hard Salsa, which is getting a lot of attention from retailers and distributors alike. Topo Chica Mineral Water is beloved in the biggest markets throughout the United States, especially in Texas, a high potential market. Quickly on its heels, we plan to bring Topo Chica Ranch Water to market. And again, we see this brand is best positioned to take advantage of the ranch water craze that has been inspired by Topo Chica Mineral Water enthusiasts mixing up ranch water at home. And still to come is Proof Point, our first spirited salsa. When all four seltzers are in market later this spring, we believe we will boast the strongest, most differentiated seltzer lineup in the United States. And while we started behind others in the United States, in Canada and Europe, we are early entrants in the hard seltzer category. In the next couple of weeks, we are taking both Vizzy and Coors Seltzer into Canada. In Europe, building on an existing brand partnership already in market, the launch of our own threefold brand seltzer is planned for March, and we will be leading the development of the category across Central and Eastern Europe with an own brand in the second quarter. In above premium beers, we have high expectations for Blue Moon Light Sky, which ended 2020 as the number one new beer in the United States per Nielsen. We've expanded its production capacity by approximately 400%. We're putting more marketing muscle behind it, and we believe this is a brand that's going to continue to rise for quite some time. Our regional craft portfolio in the United States grew 17% per Nielsen in 2020, outpacing the craft segment once again. And next month, we will be taking Hop Valley National in the U.S. and Canada. It's our first national IPA, and we believe it will be another driver of growth for our above-premium portfolio. And do not forget about Yingling. This fall, the newly formed joint venture plans to bring Yingling to one of America's biggest beer-drinking states, Texas. The reception has already been incredible, and there is significant upside potential with Yingling as the joint venture begins its westward expansion. At the beginning of last year, we changed our name to the Molson Coors Beverage Company, and it wasn't just words. By the end of the year, our non-ALK strategy came into focus. We're piloting our own brands with our partner, LR Libations. We've taken equity investments in other opportunities, including two with legendary non-ALK innovator Lance Collins. We've signed distribution agreements to enter the fast-growing spaces like RTD Coffee with La Cologne and Energy Drinks with Zoa through our new Energy Drink partnership with the leadership team led by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Zoa is getting very positive reaction from retailers and distributors. The Rock isn't just putting his name on this. He's personally making calls to retailers. We're bringing that to market this spring. We think Zoe could be a game changer in the energy drink space. Trust Canada, our Canadian cannabis joint venture with Hexo, launched their beverage portfolio in August. And by December, they jumped to the number one dollar share position with four of the top five cannabis beverage SKUs in Canada. And Trust USA is building on that through their first lineup of hemp-derived CBD beverages in Colorado, which entered the market in December. We are learning a lot about the exciting category following the launch. This entire lineup is a tremendous growth opportunity for our business. It will be a driving force behind our goal to build our emerging growth division 
into a $1 billion revenue business by 2023. And as a reminder, that ambition does not include our hard salsas. And we recently announced our first entry into the fast-growing RTD cocktail space through an exclusive equity and distribution agreement with Superbird and above premium tequila-based Paloma. Last year, we also made major investments to help our business grow the top line. We invested in our e-commerce capabilities all around the globe with more staff and more robust digital capabilities. And it paid off last year with 230% growth in e-commerce in the U.S. alone. We expanded our seltzer production capacity by approximately 400%. And we also expanded our light sky production capacity by approximately 400%. We completed a sleek can production line capable of manufacturing approximately 750 million sleek cans annually. And on the topic of cans, I'm really pleased to say that our packaging material supply has vastly improved for glass bottles, paperboard, and tall cans with all returning to normal material availability. In fact, our Coors light can inventory is higher than it was at this point last year. And our industry standard can supply is improving. We have sourced cans from four continents and work closely with our suppliers to keep up with a very high rate of consumer demand, and we expect to return to normal material availability by the end of this quarter. We will continue investing in our capabilities throughout the year as we work to grow our ability to produce high margin above premium products. Last, but certainly not least, is how we are supporting our people and our communities. This one is particularly important to me. When I took over as CEO, I made it clear that I want Molson Coors to have a people-first culture. And that approach guided our decision-making throughout the last year. The work in this space is never done, but we are making important progress. Last summer, we set a goal of increasing the representation among people of color in the United States by 25% by the end of 2023, across the country, among salaried employees and in leadership positions each where market availability shows we have room for improvement. We have made progress towards that goal and we expect to continue to do so. We also increased our support for organizations dedicated to equality, empowerment, racial justice and community building and provided nearly three million meals to families in our hometown communities struggling with food insecurity. But we must do more. So today I'm proud to announce that not only will we recommit to matching last year's investments in our communities, we have also committed to spend a total of $1 billion with diverse suppliers over the next three years. This is a commitment that benefits all of us. A wider base of talented suppliers with different backgrounds and life experiences will be a benefit to our company. And the diverse suppliers who earn our business will be able to turn in, in turn hire more talented employees into their businesses. Last summer, we said that Molson Coors response to addressing racial injustice would not just be a moment in time passing things, set aside and forgotten as other priorities took over. That would be unacceptable. Our commitment to investing in our communities and striving for equal opportunity for all people will not fail. Even with the unforeseeable challenges of last year, we built on the strength of our iconic core. The second half of 2020, we achieved a record high portion of our U.S. portfolio in above premium products. We expanded beyond the bureau. We invested in our capabilities. We supported our people and our communities, and we are not about to stop now. When I took over this role, I told you that we would plan and invest to grow our top line. And we're going to follow through on that, and we're on the pathway there. Folks, this is our revitalization plan in action. I know there have been questions about whether or not we can execute all of this, but no one has to wonder any longer because we're doing it right now, today. And now I'll turn it over to Tracy, who can provide you with more detail on our financial performance and our outlook for 2021. Tracy? Thank you, Gavin, and hello, everyone. The coronavirus pandemic had a significant impact on our 2020 financial performance, primarily due to the on-premise restrictions and lockdowns. Our Europe business was the most impacted, particularly in the UK, where our business skews heavily towards the on-premise and drove revenue and EBITDA declines in both the fourth quarter and for the full year 2020. In fact, Europe, which accounted for only 15% of our revenue in 2020, 
contributed to 61% of revenue decline and 83% of our EBITDA decline for the year, and 92% of the revenue decline and 56% of our EBITDA decline for the fourth quarter. Despite these incredible challenges in 2020, we are proud of our resilience and the financial performance as we have navigated through these unprecedented times. Now let me take you through our full year performance and then I'll touch on our quarterly results before moving on to our outlook. Recapping the year, consolidated net sales revenue decreased 8.7% in constant currency, of which North America was down 4.3% while Europe was down 28.4% on a constant currency basis. While we delivered net pricing growth in North America and Europe, as well as positive brand and package mix in the US, this was more than offset by volume declines and unfavorable channel mix, principally driven by varying degrees of on-premise restrictions throughout much of the year due to the coronavirus pandemic which also drove packaging material constraints due to the unprecedented can demand. Brand volumes declined 7.8% and financial volumes declined 8.9%. North American shipment trends improved in the second half of the year as certain packaging material constraints eased and we built distributor inventory. Net sales per hectolitre on a brand volume basis grew 1.1% in constant currency due to pricing growth in North America and Europe, as well as positive brand and package mix in the US. The success of our above premium innovations, including Busy, Blue Moon Light Sky and Cruz Salsa, helped drive US NSR per hectolitre up 2.3% for the year. Underlying COGS per hectolitre increased 2.8% on a constant currency basis driven by cost inflation, including higher transportation costs, volume deleverage, and mixed impacts from premiumization in North America, partially offset by cost savings. Higher can sourcing costs in North America contributed to the higher cost inflation. After the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, we aggressively began sourcing additional aluminum cans from all over the world to support our core brands to address unprecedented off-premise demand. Also, we saw a tightening of the freight market throughout the year, which has led to higher transportation costs. Underlying MGNA decreased 9.9% on a constant currency basis as we quickly took action Servicing spend away from areas impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, particularly live entertainment events and sporting events due to shortened or delayed seasons, such as the delayed start of the NHL season into 2021. In the second half of the year, we began to progressively increase marketing spend, particularly in social and TV media, setting up support behind our new innovations, such as Vizzy, Blue Moon Light Sky and Cruise Salsa, in alignment with additional supply coming online, as well as continuing to support our core Cruz Light, Miller Light, and other iconic core brands. MGNA declines were also driven by targeted cost mitigation actions and significant cost savings in the first year of our revitalization cost savings program. In aggregate, we delivered approximately $270 million across MGNA and cost of goods sold placing us on track to meet our $600 million target in total growth savings. These reductions were offset by innovation spend and citing lower incentive compensation and a non-recurring vendor benefit in the prior year, which we referenced last quarter. As a result, underlying EBITDA decreased 10% on a constant currency basis. Underlying free cash flow was $1.3 billion for the year, a decrease of $104 million from the prior year, driven by lower underlying EBITDA and higher cash taxes, partially offset by favorable working capital. The working capital benefit was driven by the deferral of approximately $150 million in tax payments from various government-sponsored payment deferral programs related to the coronavirus pandemic, of which we currently anticipate the majority to be paid in 2021 as they become due. Capital expenditures incurred were $530 million for the year. 
With improved liquidity and strong cash management, we were able to accelerate certain investments in expanding our production capacity and capabilities to support new innovations and growth initiatives. In addition to the strong free cash flow performance, we made tremendous strides in improving our financial flexibility, including continuing to pay down debt, favorably amending our U.S. revolving credit facilities, and suspending our dividend in May for the remainder of 2020. We reduced our net debt position by $1.1 billion in 2020 and reduced our trailing 12 months net debt to underlying EBITDA ratio to three and a half times as we remain committed to maintaining our investment grade rating. Now let's discuss the fourth quarter, where again, Europe, due to the on-premise lockdowns, had a significant and disproportionately negative impact on our results. Consolidated net sales revenue declined 8.3% in constant currency, principally due to financial volume declines as a result of the on-premise restrictions, along with corresponding negative channel mix, partially offset by net pricing growth in North America and Europe, as well as positive brand and package mix in the U.S. North American net sales revenue was down 1% in constant currency. However, in the U.S., despite increased on-premise restrictions and aluminum can supply constraints, we delivered net sales revenue growth of 1.9% in the quarter. And we continue to build distributor inventory in the U.S., with brand volumes down 6.2% compared to domestic shipment declines of 2.3%. Growth in the U.S. business was more than offset by lower volumes and negative mix in Canada, and to a lesser degree, Latin America, as a result of the on-premise restrictions. In Europe, net sales revenue was down 39.4% in constant currency, driven by volume declines and negative mix due to increased on-premise restrictions, with the most meaningful in the UK, which experienced a return to almost total on-premise lockdown for November and the historically strong month of December and with the subdued nature of many festive celebrations during the fourth quarter, we did not see a big shift of volume into the off-premise. Net sales per hectolitre on a brand volume basis increased 3.7% in constant currency, reflecting net pricing growth in North America and Europe, more than offsetting the negative mix effects of the various market dynamics and consumer shifts caused by the coronavirus pandemic. In the U.S., net sales per hectolitre on a brand volume basis increased 4.2%, driven by favorable sales mix from new innovations and strong net pricing growth. While in Europe, net sales per hectolitre on a brand volume basis decreased 8.2% due to unfavorable mix, particularly driven by the higher margin U.K. business, which more than offset pricing increases. Underlying costs per hectolitre increased 6.4% on a constant currency basis as we saw a greater impact from freight inflation and U.S. mixed premiumization in Q4 compared to the full year. MG&A in the quarter increased 5.8% on a constant currency basis due to higher planned marketing spend to support our core brands and key innovations, as well as cycling lower incentive compensation and a non-recurring vendor benefit in the fourth quarter of 2019. This was partially offset by cost savings and lower discretionary spend. As a result, underlying EBITDA decreased 33.6% on a constant currency basis, disproportionately driven by Europe. Given the length and severity of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on our Europe business, as well as the protracted recovery currently expected in certain on-premise markets, we recognise the goodwill impairment charge of $1.5 billion in our Europe segment. We also recognise a $39.6 million of asset impairment charges in our North American segment. These charges are non-cash and are not included in the underlying results. So this takes me to our financial outlook. As you may recall, on March the 27th of last year, we withdrew our guidance due to the uncertainty driven by the coronavirus pandemic. While uncertainty remains, in an effort to help enhance visibility, we have determined to reinstate our practice of providing guidance. We have also determined to adjust the metrics provided, which includes adding guidance for net sales revenue, 
a metric which aligns with our revitalization plan goals for driving top line growth, as well as next year to underline EBITDA leverage ratios given our commitment to remaining investment grade. We are very proud of our performance and agility in navigating the coronavirus pandemic and executing against our revitalization plan, but recognize that headwinds remain. The pandemic continues to impact our business due to on-premise losses across all our geographies, and disproportionately so in Europe as well as Canada. We expect this domestic shipment trends in the U.S. to continue to be higher than brand volume trends in the first quarter as we continue to build inventories heading into the peak season. For the year, we maintain our annual goal of shipping to consumption in the U.S. In Europe, we continue to experience significant lockdowns and expect first quarter volumes will be materially impacted versus the prior year period, similar to what was experienced in the fourth quarter of 2020. For 2021, we expect to deliver mid-single-digit net sales revenue growth. 2021 is intended to be a year of investment as we continue to deliver our revitalization plan and drive towards long-term growth. This entails increasing year-over-year marketing spend to build on the strength of our core brands and support our successful 2020 launches, including Blue Moon Lifestyle, Busy, and Queer Salsa, and new innovations to come, as well as investing in further expanding our capabilities to drive productivity and efficiency. We expect significant increases in spend beginning in the second quarter versus the prior year comparable quarter. While we continue to expect revitalization plan savings, as I discussed, given this increased investment, along with cost headwinds related to higher inflation, including transportation costs, and continued premiumization of our portfolio, we anticipate 2021 underlying EBITDA to be approximately flat compared to the prior year. We anticipate underlying depreciation and amortization of $800 million, net interest expense of $270 million plus or minus 5%, and an effective tax rate in the range of 20 to 23%. We enter 2021 with greatly improved financial flexibility, better enabling us to not only continue to invest in our business, but to continue to pay down debt and return cash to shareholders in 2021. As I mentioned, we significantly reduced our net debt position by $1.1 billion in 2020 and reduced our leverage ratio to three and a half times as of December 31st, 2020. We are proud of this progress and are establishing a target net debt to underlying EBITDA ratio of approximately 3.25 times by the end of 2021 and below three times by the end of 2022. And we currently anticipate that our board of directors will be in a position to reinstate a dividend in the second half of this year. We are doing all of this while continuing our commitment to maintaining and in time upgrading our investment grade rating. Given the operating environment, we are pleased with our 2020 financial performance, which underscores our strong progress against our revitalization plan and the resilience of our company and our people who have united to successfully navigate and overcome challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic. While these challenges have created some near-term fluctuations in financial and operating results, we are confident we are on the right path of driving towards long-term revenue and underlying EBITDA growth. We look forward to updating you on our continued progress. So with that, we look forward to taking your questions. Operator? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchdown phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please limit yourself to one question. The first question today comes from Andrea Texera with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. It's actually Coach on for Andrea. Hi. So just at a high level, we're – hey, how are you? Just at a high level, we're just wondering if you could provide a little bit of color on how depletions have trended quarter to date uh, in both North America and Europe. Look, we don't provide guidance on um, – um, 
uh, it, you know, in months um, depletions, um, lots of ups and downs. But from a European point of view, uh, as Tracy said in her opening remarks, uh, you know, the on-premise remains in lockdown, um, and so we expect uh, the first quarter volumes in Europe and particularly in the United Kingdom to be um, to be challenged. Uh, from a from a U.S. Uh, point of view, um, the lockdowns uh, remain, although it does vary um, from from state uh, to state, and we do see a loosening of um, on-premise restrictions both in North America and in um, in uh, Europe as we progress into Q2 and further on into into the year. From a from a supplier point of view, just reiterate my comments in the script that our Coors Light uh, can supplier is much improved, um, and our inventory levels are actually higher than they were at the same time last year. So we're well positioned to to take advantage of uh, this, this, the the uh, brand health uh, strength of Coors Light. The next question comes from Kevin Grundy with Jefferies. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to, to spend some time on, on Europe, just given the, uh, the, the impact in, in the quarter. So obviously pretty challenging, uh, both from a revenue and, and profitability perspective. Uh, understanding that the impairment charge is, is non-cash, it, it naturally signals a, a less confident outlook and, and ability to return to levels of profitability perhaps you, you'd previously thought, at least within a reasonable amount of time when, when you're doing the discounted cash flow model. So, Gavin, it'd be good to, to get your updated views on your outlook for this business, strategic fit within the portfolio, and, and, and how you're thinking about the cost structure given this less constructive outlook. And then, Tracy, for you relatedly, not to get too much in the weeds with this, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand the margins in the quarter. So the top line pressure in the second quarter was was worse than than the fourth, but the margin performance was was clearly a lot more pressured. You know, the decremental margins in, in the second quarter uh, about 25 percent, closer to 60 percent in, in the fourth quarter. It just seemed like there was a better ability to sort of flex down MG&A in the second quarter than there was in the fourth. I think it'd be useful for folks if, if you could maybe spend a little bit of time on that. So thank you both. I'll pass it on. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'll talk about um, about Europe and and, and performance uh, specifically. Look, I mean the on-premise restrictions in in Q4 were were fairly draconian. Um, you know, there, there was somewhat of a of a scattergun appro approach across across Europe, which which made it a little harder for us to to plan and and, and react to, particularly on the on the cost line. Um, you know, when you compare Q4 versus Q2, the, the, the impact for Q4 was particularly pronounced because, you know, December's historically been a very strong month for the on-premise in the UK, given, given the holidays. And, of course, you know, you can't be outdoors uh, that much um, comfortably in, um, in the fourth quarter as much as you can be in the, in the, in the, in the second quarter. Um, it's also a seasonally lower trading period um, in Central and, and Eastern Europe. So, um, you know, we saw similar declines in the second and fourth quarters from a volume perspective, um, but the on-premise restrictions in the second quarter were more uniform, so it, it made it easier for us to, to plan. Certainly the, the lockdowns, as I said earlier, have continued into the, into the first quarter. We did make some conscious decisions in Q4, though, Kevin, to invest behind our core brands, not only in the United States, but also in uh, Europe, and in particular in, um, in Central Europe. We've got some strong um, brand strong, healthy brands, um, and, and we wanted to make sure we positioned ourselves for sustainable recovery in 2021. So, you know, that explains why the MGNA in Europe was uh, was a little higher than you than you might have been expecting. We were investing behind our, our, our brands. Um, what, other, what else? Question there? Um, yeah, uh, um, so Kevin did ask about the strategic outlook. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, Kevin, our, our top priority as a company as a whole is, is, is to make sure that we emerge strong coming out of the pandemic when the on-premise returns uh, to more normalized levels. And this includes Europe, which, which we continue to view as a strategic asset. And then maybe Thanks, if, I can, if I can just jump in on the margin. So, yeah, you know, in, in Europe in Q4, we focused our marketing investment on specific brands and markets where we had capacity. 
And we needed to ensure that we were competitive in context of, of share of voice and, and brand health metrics. Um, and so the investments that we made in Q4 in Europe were to support the ongoing performance of our national champion brands and, and our premiumization. Um, and then also just to note, we were cycling comparatively much lighter spend in Q4 of 2019 in Central Europe. So, you know, that would account for some of the margin differences. Okay. Thank you very much. A bunch of questions, but I'll pass it on. Thank you. The next question comes from Komai Jagarwala with Credit Swiss. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can, um, can you talk a bit about your expectations for the on-premise for 2021 as it relates to what you've incorporated into your, into your guidance and what sort of, uh, and specifically to the U.S., um, at what rate do you expect it to recover? How much does that contribute to your numbers? And then if you could also maybe help us with uh, mechanically what that means for your business. I believe your shares are higher off-premise. We kind of know that over the course of 2020, large pack sizes um, started took, took a larger degree of share from uh, the rest of what was being sold at food retail. That obviously will look very different when we get to an on-premise, a more normalized on-premise environment. So. Um, is that a net? Are you a net share beneficiary as the on-premise turns back on? Does it work the opposite direction? If you could help us with some details there, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Komal. Um, yeah, a lot in there. Let me try and give you some uh, some context. Uh, obviously, the reality is the situation remains fluid and it varies market uh, by by market. Um, in the third quarter of last year, we we did see some on-premise reopenings pretty much across the board in in the countries in which we operated. And, and during the fourth quarter, we saw a return to you know, much more severe on-premise uh, restrictions as, as most countries went back into strict lockdowns and there was no benefit of, of outdoor dining given the, given the climate. Um, you know, in terms of our major markets in the UK, the government operated a tiered system of restrictions in October. Then they followed that up with a national lockdown in, um, in November. Um, they returned to a tiered system in December, but... You know, pretty much um, the UK is, is, is locked down as we as we speak. Um, in North America, Canada was particularly um, in, impacted more than um, the US from a lockdown point of view. It was a, it was a stricter lockdown, and then we really did see varied pictures across uh, the United States, um, depending on which state. So, from an on-premise performance point of view, in the United States, it's it's been fairly fairly stable for a while now. Um, it, 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 there's no big spark up, up or down. In terms of market share, uh, we think that the consumer moving to you know, big and trusted brands will benefit us in all the uh, markets in which, in which we operate and uh, where we have seen reopenings. We've seen that play through from a, from a market uh, share point of view. So I think we will be uh, net uh, uh, beneficiaries when that takes place. I mean, obviously, in our both premium portfolio, uh, we were very pleased with our performance um, in the both premium in the fourth quarter, and that in the face of Blue Moon and Peroni, which are strong on-premise on bad brands, being obviously challenged because of the lack of on-premise. So we expect that when the on-premise comes back more fully, that those two brands will be um, big beneficiaries of it. Um, if you look at the UK, which is our largest, which is the market which has the largest on-premise um, exposure, you know, we've demonstrated a, a, a sustained track record of growing our share in the, in the on-premise in the UK. For, for at least five years pre-pandemic, we've grown our share in the on-premise as, we, as we've driven to, to be first choice uh, for, our, for our customers. And in fact, just learned this week that we were number one again with our customers in the Net Promoter Score survey across the trade um, in 2020. So, you know, we've got uh, contracts to supply them. Uh, many of our competitors in both the retail and wholesale uh, models, um, our customers uh, value the service that we, that we bring through our own brands and also our wholesale brands. And so we believe we're well positioned uh, to gain share in the UK market uh, when it, when it uh, reopens. I think I got all your questions there, Kamal. Yeah, you did, and, uh, and it was probably unfair. It was a lot of questions in one. <laughs> If I can, uh, so I'm ask if just a follow up on the portfolio, um, and maybe your best guess. You've announced a, a, a series of deals over the last number of months. If you were to maybe give us an idea, can you can you give a best guess of 
uh, what your portfolio breakdown is likely to look at look like by the end of the year. Is it still likely to be about two thirds premium lights, uh, followed by uh, so, followed by uh, high end, and, and and I don't know how much uh, non alcohol will be as part of it, but maybe just give some idea of if we put all of these deals together, how your portfolio may look different as we move forward with the rollouts of these products in the next 12 months. Let me try and give you some color there, Colonel. Obviously, we've been very clear about the objective in our revitalization plan of driving our bus premium portfolio and our beyond uh, beer portfolio. Um, you know, almost all of the deals we've done come at the bus premium um, margin. So that was, you know, two of the of the five focus areas um, in our revitalization plan that we announced in um, October of, of, of 2019. Um, and we're going to continue building on that. You could see the, the results of that in both the third quarter and the fourth quarter with our with our, um, our positive mix, which we generated. You know, we generated another uh, quarter above 200 basis points of, of positive mix, which is which is continuing to reflect our our growth um, and performance in above premium. Uh, per Nielsen, we actually grew share of, uh, of above premium despite the on-premise challenges, which you know brands like Blue Moon and Peroni. Um, have, have um, experienced. Uh, we think that, um, you know, we, we, we obviously put out the um, ambition of getting to a billion uh, dollars revenue uh, for our uh, emerging growth division, which is going to uh, require that uh, many of our partnerships that we've just announced, like our Zoa partnership, like Alarm and so on, are, are successful. And, you know, they, they're, they're coming off a, off a standing start of, of zero because we didn't have them uh, before. Um, you know, I'd also uh, point you to the fact that we actually grew the top line in um, the very market where uh, concerns have been expressed about our ability to execute. Uh, we grew the top line in the fourth quarter, despite all these um, ch um, deals that we've done and the challenges that we've faced. And we're going to build on that in, uh, in uh, 2021. Uh, there is a lot of excitement from retail and from our distributors with the deals that we've done, um, you know, Particularly brands like uh, like Zoa um, and and, and uh, Terpa Chica, a lot of excitement, and, and that will uh, continue to improve our above premium uh, mix. Hope that's helpful. Okay, great, thank you. The next question comes from Sean King with UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I guess my question is, um, you know, with hard seltzer becoming a larger portion of the mix and, I guess, the growth story um, going forward, can you discuss, I guess, the, the, the gross margin profile um, of that business for you and, and how that could change over time? Now, the hard seltzer has been a very strong growth category. We believe that's going to continue in, in, in 2021, um, and we're excited about our opportunity for hard seltzers. Um, we think we've got one of the strongest portfolios of hard seltzers um, with each brand having a very unique perspective on the category. So, you know, by the time that we have all four of our hot salsas in markets uh, this year, we, we think it's differentiated, provides a differentiated offering to our consumers, and I think we're well placed. Um, salsas do operate at the, at the upper end of the above premium um, price point and therefore operate at the, at the sort of upper end of our, of our uh, margin structure. We don't give it out... Um, Publicly, specifically, but you can you can be assured that it's that it's um, that it's that it's high. Great, thank you very much. The next question comes from Chris Carey with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I, I guess just conceptually, um, trying to understand how, how you think about the off-premise channel in, in 2020. Um, certainly, um, there was more strength there as uh, as there was a channel shift. But but I guess I'm also hearing that it sounds like you think there's some sustainability um, to the growth that you've seen there, and certainly you're going to be investing behind that. And so you know, and, and I guess underlying the question is, um, I'm trying to understand what what you think might be sustainable coming out of this year, and certainly in 2021, if um, if the recovery of the on-premise is a bit slower than um, what might happen, just trying to understand sensitivities around what's needed to occur in the, in the off-premise in order to get you to this top-line growth algorithm. Thanks. 
certainly believe that there will be some sustainability to the off-premise uh, demand. I think consumers have, have, have learned new behaviors and, and, and new occasions have been created. Um, so I think there will be some sustainability of it. Now, obviously, um, we don't believe that it's going to continue to, to, to grow at the same, at the same level, but there's, there certainly will be sustainability to the underlying uh, trend. There is a very large pent-up demand uh, for on-premise uh, from consumers. And so I think when uh, the on-premise is more readily um, uh, open, um, I think we'll see a, a, a strong pent-up demand uh, from consumers. The other behavioral change which we've obviously experienced in 2020 is the growth of e-commerce uh, sales. There are many consumers of alcoholic beverages that didn't realize you could buy a beer online, and, I, and they do now, and we've seen you know, 230% increase in our online uh, sales, and I think that that trend um, will stay, and, 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 and that's why we're making investments in our e-commerce uh, capabilities. Thanks, Chris. The next question comes from Bonnie Herzog with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am... Um, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more color on how you're thinking about balancing your investment needs be between your recent innovations and some of the launches with marketing and support behind your core brands. I guess what I'm, I'm still maybe struggling with is how you plan to stabilize or, you know, maybe even improve your core business if a lot of your, you know, stepped up investment spend and attention is going to be focused behind all these new initiatives. And then, Gavin, maybe you could help frame for us some of your targets or ambitions for your, your core business, similar to how you're, you know, framing the opportunities and some of the goals you put out there for, you know, all these new and exciting brands and partnerships. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Look, I mean, you know, our revitalization plan, which, which we announced in October 2019, required us to do both, and that was our, that's our plan, and it remains our plan. Um, you know, investing behind our iconic core brands and investing behind above premium and investing behind our Beyond Port Beer portfolio is, is the plan. Um, you know, Tracy mentioned in the guidance, um, you know, approximately flat either are, and that's really the uh, revitalization planning come, coming to life with, a, with, with in our, our big investments behind both Miller Light and Coors Light, which will see more spend uh, this year. Uh, we'll put more spend behind um, our above premium portfolio um, with um, Blue Moon Light Sky and, 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 and Blue Moon. Uh, we'll put more money um, behind uh, Celsius. We will have four Celsius in market this year. We only had two. One was launched in April. The other one was launched in September. This year we, we're going to have four as we strive to get to the 10% uh, um, um, market uh, share. And uh, we're going to be investing behind our um, uh, new ventures like uh, like uh, Zoa and uh, Local Home and, and also our uh, Yingling uh, joint venture. In, in terms of, of actual performance, uh, Bonnie, you know, Coors Light and Miller Light have performed really well um, in, in spite of the, of, of, of the headwinds uh, which they've got. We've uh, made numerous uh, pivots from a, from a marketing uh, point of view to uh, meet the changed uh, circumstances, and where necessary, we put uh, marketing money behind it um, in the fourth quarter, for, for, for example. Um, you know, from a media perspective, we shifted our media to, to, to uh, places like social, gaming, podcasts, online, video, and so on. And, and from a creative point of view, we've, we've, we've created, um, you know, new creative, which has resonated with consumers. Uh, we've actually created 40 pieces of new creative since, um, since March. Um, a lot of that has been behind Miller Lite and Coors Light. I mean, just some examples of that would be our, our farewell work holiday party for, for Miller Lite and then our a campaign to get Tom Flores into the Pro Football Hall of Fame with uh, with, with Coors Light, and and you can see the benefits of of, of that for with both of those brands. I mean, in Coors Light drove significant share growth in the first half of the year. It did slow down in the third quarter because of the inventory uh, supply constraints which we had, which which we're now through because our inventory is higher than it was at the same time last year for for Coors Light. And in December, we saw the best industry share trend we've seen in years outside of the pantry load, um, loading for March for, for Coors Light. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the Made to Chill campaign platform is working, and we're excited about it. And, 
you know, Miller Lite's uh, share trends have been have been strong. Now, we, obviously, as I said in my opening remarks, we're not satisfied um, uh, with with the performance until, um, and we we intend to put more more money behind it. So I, that's a very long-winded way of saying. You know, it's it's both. It's not either or. We're not sacrificing one uh, for the other. Uh, we believe that we can um, do more than one thing at one time, and we believe that we're demonstrating it because, you know, the, the market where we've had the most uh, concern about our ex ex execution capability is the U.S., and uh, we've grown our top line. We grew our margin. Um, strong pricing, strong brand mix. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is the revitalization plan in action. It's uh, not a series of one-offs. Um, it's, uh, it's all part of a single strategy, and that's the revitalization plan, which is specifically aimed to drive uh, top-line growth. And we believe we will do that in, uh, in 2021. Okay. Thank you so much for all that. It was, it was helpful. I appreciate it. Funny. The next question comes from Rob. Audit time with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Great. Th thank you very much. Um, Gavin, obviously a, a lot of tremendous uh, initiatives uh, that you have uh, for 2021. Um, and clearly, you know, you're, you're very optimistic uh, in terms of the firm's trajectory. Um, however, obviously, you know, there's, there's a bit of a, a disconnect in terms of how the uh, the public markets are, are viewing uh, your your outlook and prospects, um, just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are uh, in terms of share buybacks at some point. Uh, I know you talk about uh, very significant uh, deleveraging, uh, you know, bringing the dividend back. Uh, you know, how, how does the potential for share buybacks play into this if this disconnect continues? And, and also maybe, Tracy, remind us uh, about, you know, your, your cash tax rate, uh, which I believe remains very advantaged, uh, kind of roughly what that level is and how long it stays at that depressed uh, or lower level. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Good morning. Um, look, I mean, we... We, as, as, I, as I said earlier on, you know, we, we announced our revitalization plan in 2019, and we're executing that revitalization plan. Um, I'm very pleased with the platform that we laid in 2020, and I think it gives us a really good springboard uh, for, for, for 2021, uh, which is why we've uh, felt confident uh, with, the, with the guidance uh, that, we've, that we've put out there. So I understand there's skepticism around our ability to execute. Uh, but we wouldn't uh, be putting guidance out if we didn't believe uh, that we would achieve it. Um, you know, Tracy was very clear about our leverage goals. Um, I'll let you comment on, um, on our capital allocation, Trace, which I think was the underlying yeah. question that, that Rob had. Yeah, so, so um, hi, Rob. So, yeah, obviously, um, you know, we are having ongoing um, conversations um, around our capital allocation with our board. Um, our focus has been on um, improving our leverage ratio because of the, you know, um, commitment to maintain our invest investment grade rating, as well as investing in our business um, to... Uh, to deliver the revitalization plan, which is around, you know, top-line growth. So, um, you know, as, as always, um, you know, we'd look at our capital allocation um, budget, have a look at what gives us the, the highest, what gives our shareholders the highest rate of return. We run through, um, you know, everything through our PAC model to make those, those decisions. But, you know, um, our intention is to continue to pay down our, our, our debt um, to uh, improve our leverage ratio. And um, as I said in the prepared remarks, you know, it, it is um, important for us, and we said this on the Q3 call as well, um, as soon as appropriate to reinstate the dividend. And, you know, as I said in the guidance, you know, that's something that we do um, anticipate our board will be in a position to, to reinstate in the back half of this year. Um, so just in terms of the, the tax cash um, question, so yes, we do still get a benefit. Um, from the step up, uh, as, as um, you know, we did with the, the Miller Coors acquisition, 
Um, and, you know, that does still run for another few years, um, Rob, but, um, yeah. Can, can you remind us what exactly that rate, what you expect, that what that rate was in 2020 and, and what you expect it to be in 21? Yeah, so we, we don't actually give that guidance, and, and we didn't, other than, you know, giving the guidance um, that we've given you now on the consolidated effective tax rate um, for 2021 being between 20 and 23 percent. But isn't the cash tax rate half that? Yeah, okay. yeah. that's work in progress, um, but it is it does reduce the, the tax rate um, fairly significantly. Rob? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Brian Spillane with BOA. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, j just a, maybe a follow-up question on, on cash flow. I don't think I saw it, but, but Tracy, could you help us a little bit with um, what you're expecting for capital spending for this year and also um, – maybe tie to that, you know, how we should think about free cash flow uh, conversion in, in 21. Are there any sort of big moving parts that we should consider in terms of uh, free cash flow? And, again, some help with CapEx would be, would be helpful as well. Yeah, so, Brian, we looked at our metrics, our guidance metrics for this year to really align with our strategy around our revitalization plan goals. Um, and then also looked at metrics which um, aligns with our commitment to maintain um, and over time improve our investment grade rating. So we haven't um, given CapEx um, and uh, we haven't given free cash flow um, because we, we do believe that um, the, the, the target leverage ratio metric um, is more meaningful and more aligned to our strategy. But, but we're going to have to put a CapEx estimate into our – into our cash flow statement? I mean, is it, you know, is, is 2020 a reasonable sort of, you know, guide to use? Just any, any, any kind of help at all just to get some sense of, of what we should be flowing in there. So I would say, um, you know, the guidance that we gave back in 2020, which we, we subsequently withdrew, um, would be the sort of um, range of CapEx that you'd expect. There, there is, um, you know, nothing significant that we've got um, planned at this stage. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question comes from Laurent Gregay with Guggenheimer. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for squeezing me in. Um, got a question regarding the uh, the, the BNB air. So, so many on that front, there is almost not a week without a a new product showing up. So key question from investors is about your ability to, uh, to prioritize and not to disrupt your core business. So could you please give us uh, maybe some element of comfort on that front in terms of execution? And secondly, in, uh, you mentioned you should reach about $1 billion in our sales by 2023, and that doesn't include... Uh, so could you please help us frame how you get there because it's about three years to get to $1 billion from almost zero. So uh, that would be super helpful. Thank you very much. Revitalization plan requires us to do uh, more than one thing at a time. It does both, and I think our, our fourth quarter is a is a is a is a fine example of that. We we grew our top line in the U.S. We grew our our um, our, our, our net sales revenue per hectoliter meaningfully. Uh, we had positive uh, brand mix. And uh, we demonstrated that we could uh, deal with uh, with complexity. I mean, the, the structure that we put in place in our company was designed to deal with complexity. Uh, you know, we've got a team that focuses on the core brands and very pleased with what they've done with, with uh, Coors Light and, and Miller Light and our other uh, legacy iconic uh, brands. And then we've got a team that focuses on uh, Beyond Beer that's executing against that. So it's, ex it's exactly as we, as we laid out the... Um, the uh, revitalization plan, and um, we're demonstrating that we can do that in our largest uh, market. In terms of the billion dollars um, revenue ambition for emerging growth, um, you know, it does, it does encompass a number of areas in the emerging growth. So we're not coming uh, from a standing start. Um, we do have all our craft companies in that area. Uh, we have our, our, our non-ALK um, division. We have uh, our cannabis uh, 
THC um, infused um, beverages, RTDs, and, and, and our CBD business. It also includes all of our Latin America um, exports and uh, license markets. So, you know, in order to get to a billion dollars, we're going to have to grow our top line for the emerging growth division by uh, 50% uh, to give you some idea of, of the base that we're that we're uh, that we're coming off. So, um, hopefully, that's helpful, Lauren. Yeah, thank you very much. Good luck, guys. Thank you. The next question comes from Steve Powers with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks and good morning. Um, yeah, yeah, just one more question for me on the on the Beyond Beer on Beyond Beer topic, Gavin. Um, I mean, you've highlighted a lot in this call, but I guess I'm hoping you could talk a little bit more about the economics um, of that Beyond Beer push, whether in terms of penny profit or margins, especially when it comes to um, the distribution deals that you've been you've been um, tacking on. You, you mentioned Zoa a couple of times. <laughs> with enthusiasm, um, for example. I'm just curious if you can clarify how those relationships are structured from the perspective of the molten core shareholder. Um, I mean, if, if Zoe truly is a game changer in the energy market, um, that would be great. But I guess how are those profits to be split between you, your distribution partners, uh, and, the, and the brand owner itself? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Look, I mean, each deal that we've done um, has been uh, done differently and structured differently. I think it's safe to say that they all um, operate in the above premium uh, space from a, from a revenue point of view. Uh, some of these deals we've taken equity stakes in, um, some bigger than others, um, you know, but we wouldn't be going into this if we weren't uh, intending to make, to make money on these, on these deals. You know, we've got, a, we've got uh, such a route to market advantage uh, from our, our perspective. Um, you know, the biggest channel for, for energy drinks to, to, to pick on Zoe um, is 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 C store. Nobody serves the C store channel um, better than their distributors. Um, and so we think we've got some real structural advantages there. Um, but we're not going to break down each and every uh, deal that that we've done. Um, rest assured that our, our 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 intention is that these are above premium products and that we will make money on them and that we will have equity in um, most of the deals that we've done. Okay, thank you very much. The next question comes from Lauren Lieberman with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Good morning. I think to some degree you've kind of covered this, but um, my question was really just thinking about um, the EBITDA outlook for, for 21. Um, if I just think about it in terms of rate of growth, flat versus 20, it's actually better than I thought would be the case. Now, obviously, in dollar terms, the basis is lower because of the fourth quarter. Um, but just putting that, thinking about that in the context of the timing with which you'll be kind of pulsing marketing spending back in, and I'm not asking for quarterly guidance. It's more of a conceptual conversation I'd like to have. Um, is it, you know, kind of investing ahead of recovery? Is it investing concurrent with um, but just how you're thinking about marketing versus revenue growth and supporting some of the newer initiatives I, could be some helpful and interesting perspective. Thanks, Lauren. Let me try and give you some color um, without giving you our quarterly budgets. Um, in, I, I, would, I think you can expect that the second quarter would be a, a meaningful increase in, in marketing and sales spend because, you know, there was such a dislocation in the second quarter uh, last year where we – you know, so much just didn't happen, and we were we were pivoting and, and still trying to figure out what this pandemic meant. So I think it's safe to say that our marketing spend in Q2 will will be um, quite a lot higher than it was in Q2 of of, of last year. Uh, beyond that, we'll be investing behind our innovations. Um, so and 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 again behind Miller Lite and Coors Light um, at, at at the appropriate times of the of the year. But I, I think the biggest piece of guidance I can give you is is Q2 will be a, will be a meaningful um, increase. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lauren. This concludes our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the conference back over to Greg Tierney for any closing remarks. Thank you, operator. I uh, appreciate everybody joining us today. And I know there may be additional questions we weren't able to answer. Uh, please follow with me and, and our IR team uh, in, in, uh, with any of those questions, and we look forward to talking with many of you uh, as, the year, uh, as the year unfolds. With that, thanks, everybody, and 
for participating in this call and talk to you all soon. Thank you. This conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now visit.